Lord, we ask you to be with us this evening and guide us in our reflection and our discussion about what is good and what is true and what helps us to endure. The gift of the Eucharist is our most substantial um, sacramental uh, intimacy with Jesus. And so we ask that as we grow in our understanding of this celebration, we too might grow closer to him and that we might live in his light and live in his <clears throat> self-gift of loving presence. We thank you for the opportunity to reflect on these things and for our faith and all good things which come from you. And we make our prayer through Christ our Lord. Amen. Amen. Father, Son, and Holy Spirit. Amen. Amen. Okay, I want to take us back a little uh, just to kind of draw some things together because tonight we're going to be talking about some how do we interpret it and how do we understand the Eucharist and how do we make sense of it in terms of its vision, its, its, um, its concept, its idea for us. What, is it, what does it mean? And so I want to kind of remind you Oh, yeah. 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 I think I know what I'm doing sometimes, and then I don't. Is it yellow? That's the way it all I brought it. Oh, you got it? Yeah. I brought the two, two tablets down, so that's a good thing. So, we want to remember the sacrificial tradition. The tr sacrificial tradition. We're going to be exploring this a little bit tonight with a, with a reading from the letter to the Hebrews. Because Hebrews reflects on this particular aspect of the Eucharist. We're dealing with two traditions here, okay? Two old traditions. We're dealing with a meal tradition that has to do with bread and the distribution of bread. And we're dealing with the sacrificial tradition, which is the offering up of a victim for the sake of somebody else's reparation or salvation or, or the gift of life. So two traditions come together in the celebration of the Eucharist. And I, we've got to keep those in mind because that's going to have a lot to do with how these things get understood as we go forward. So these two traditions then become intertwined in the celebration of the Last Supper and the offering of Jesus on the cross, okay? So, you remember the sacrificial tradition, how a victim must be slain in order to propitiate, please, or beg God for atonement or for, or for forgiveness. So that sacrifice is a substitution for our very selves and our own death, okay? So the sacrificial victim is the token um, of ourselves. Then we come to the meal tradition. And the meal tradition includes the Passover meal and that meal that also uh, introduces us to the idea of a lamb, but also the manna as life-giving bread from heaven that God will provide for the nourishment of his people, and what we call the showbread. And the showbread was celebrated, lifted up on the golden table three times a year at the Feast of Passover, at the Feast of Tabernacles, and at the Feast of uh, Pentecost. So the elevation of that gold table and showing the bread that is, uh, is a sign of God's loving presence, is the continuation of uh, uh, what we bring to the Eucharist, or what we understand from the Eucharist. Now, did Jesus have these things specifically in mind? That's a good question. Thanks for answer, asking it. Um, did, did Jesus have this, uh, all these things in mind when he gathered his disciples in the upper room to celebrate the Passover with them? Um, I would say implicitly yes, 
but explicitly no. <laughs> that rather that the church later on brought out these dimensions to the celebration of the Eucharist in a way that Jesus really didn't because he was basing his whole sacramental activity at that last supper table on a tradition that was uh, endemically a part of him. It wasn't, he didn't just kind of grab a concept and put it down and say, okay, now we're gonna celebrate a last supper and it's gotta have all these ingredients to it. Rather instead, he comes out of a tradition in which all of these things mean something and therefore they become a part of his expression, an expression of, of who he is and of, of what he's about. So, um, then remember at the, at the elevation of the table, the golden table, some words are announced by the priest and the, the words are, behold God's love for you. And the bread is lifted up and shown to everyone. So we're gonna remember that as part of our celebration of the Eucharist. Behold God's love for you. All right. Now, what these feasts and this relationship of all these feasts to the Jewish people had to do was, uh, with was the covenant and reestablishing a covenant. And the covenant is created by an arrangement or an agreement between two parties in which um, there is a mutual sense of, uh, of uh, care for each other or acknowledgement of the importance of one another. And therefore, the lesser party is given gifts by the greater party. And here we have the covenant of God established in the Old Testament. That covenant is renewed. And we saw that last week when we looked at the epistle of uh, the Corinthians and we looked at the, uh, um, the narrative of the Eucharist in all four Gospels. So we didn't quite touch on the fourth Gospel of John but it's implicit in that gospel as well. The covenant. There's a covenant. There's an established arrangement. There's an agreement that comes about in this, this uh, celebration. Okay. So what is the covenant? Can you tell me what the terms of the covenant are? All right. I mean, yeah. I will be your God and you will be my people. Okay, but there's more specific things, okay? Do you know what they are? Of that covenant back then? Yeah. Uh, no. No. <laughs> no, no. Well, the, the, the covenant was made, remember, it was ratified and sealed with blood at Mount Sinai. So the terms were kind of exposed at Mount Sinai. What are the terms? They are the law. The law. So basically, you keep the law, you abide by the law, and I will be your God, your protector, and I will bring you to the promised land. I will bring you to the light that you see. So that covenant gets ratified and renewed in the New Testament when Jesus says, this is the covenant in my blood. This will be shed for you. Okay, so like the lamb at the Passover supper, now Jesus replaces the lamb with himself and says, I am the bread of life. I am the lamb of God. Okay? So this is, this is in Jesus' mind that his death is going to bring about a regathering of the nations of God's people. That this regathering, this reconstituting God's people is essentially his, his uh, mission. So to love, to gather, to bring, bring home to God. And he will do this in a sacrificial death, which will be symbolized in a sacramental meal. So the death is pre-presented 
in the celebration of the Lord's Supper. Okay? What does that death accomplish? <clears throat> All right. We begin with sin. God created a people for himself. He created them to, to fulfill his will. But human beings have not lived up to that covenant. Therefore, there is a fundamental alienation between human beings and God. What's the penalty for sin? Separation. Separation. And death. death. The punishment of sin is death. It says that in the book of Ezekiel. It says that in the book of Genesis and Exodus. The punishment for sin is death. So, we understand that, remember when Adam and Eve were told, do not touch the tree in the middle of the garden, lest you die. He doesn't say, lest you get kicked out of the garden and have to fend for yourself. He says, Un unless you want to die. Sin, the punishment or the, the situation of sin leads to death. So, we who are born sinful, our, uh, our, our desperation causes us to reach out to many things to seek for uh, uh, forgiveness. But we can't obtain forgiveness for ourselves. Forgiveness has to be given freely by God. So we can do all we want, but we can't forgive our sins. I mean, we can go away from a, a, a conversation with God feeling forgiven, but God has to do the forgiving. So, the punishment of sin is death. The human race has sinned. Therefore, the human race must die. Okay? This is kind of biblical atonement 101. Okay? Somebody, something, somehow has to do something for us to make us right with God again. Okay? This atonement is kind of, um, well, there's four words that we can use to describe this, what happens in the atonement. First of all, justification. Okay? Secondly, propitiation. Thirdly, redemption. And fourthly, reconciliation. So all those, those four things are accomplished by Jesus' death. Okay? So Jesus becomes the human victim who pays the penalty for our sins. Though we deserve death, Jesus is going to suffer the death for us that we deserve so that we can be brought back to God. Atonement 101. Okay? Atonement 101. Now, justifying means to be made right with God. Propitiation means somebody pleads with God or somebody makes his peace with God so as to bring about uh, uh, a, a, a situation of salvation. Um, reconciliation is to bring two parties together, and redemption is the process by which we are saved. So we say that sin, which causes death, has been reconciled and we have been redeemed by the blood of the sacrifice, the atoning sacrifice. Now, we have to understand that if we're going to understand the, the importance of the Eucharist, because the Eucharist serves as our means to participate in the atoning death of Christ. Now, am I making any sense? Let me stop. Diana, are you confused? It's not absorbing. That's all. It's not absorbing? What do you got, rocks up there? <laughs> Maybe sponges. Yeah. Okay. All right. I, but what, yeah. Would you say what redemption is again? Redemption is being 
brought back from slavery into a right relationship with God. So being brought back. And the image is often used being brought back or bought back by to Satan. Jesus paid the price to Satan. Jesus paid the price to God. Jesus didn't pay the price to either of those parties. Jesus just paid the price. And the price was because we had failed. We had sinned. And we had wandered away. And we still do. But we have uh, this atone sacrifice of atonement by which we are justified again. Redeemed, reconciled, and propitiated. Okay, yeah. So when you say that um, sin requires punishment, which equals death, why? I mean, how does uh, that come about? Because, I mean, uh, uh, it's philosophical, but the idea is if an offense against God is an infinite offense, then nothing can restore us mm -hmm. to that right relationship, you know, unless God does something on our behalf. But we can do nothing. And therefore, what's left? This alienation from God that we precipitated can only end up finally in our eternal separation from God because there's no recourse. We can't do anything to win God back because the penalty is, is against God. So how do we give God back for our penalty? We can't because there's nothing that would ultimately justify our offense in the light of God's infinite, uh, infinite love. So an offense against God is an infinite offense against God. Therefore, an infinite power has to make reparation mm -hmm. for us. Yeah. Got it? Okay. Now, um, this is important in terms of how Jesus would have viewed the Eucharist and how one of the ways in which we understand the Eucharist. So it is, it has this immense uh, meaning to it that is more than just handing out bread and wine handing out cookies, you know, here you go, this is Jesus for you. No, there's a lot more going on in this as we understand the scriptures and as we understand atonement and as we understand what God wants us to understand about his, about his love. Good? Mm -hmm. Any other questions? So we needed Jesus as an intermediary. We need Jesus as no, we need Jesus, not Jesus. Jesus. <laughs> How about cookies? We need Jesus as our inter inter intermediary. Because he has the infinite Yeah, capacity. not... Uh, um, yes. Yeah, just, just plain yes. Yes, that is true. Okay. So, now, does Jesus' death accomplish atonement for everyone. Yes. Everyone who everyone who responds. Everyone who responds. Everyone who responds. Mm -hmm. Okay. So that's why we could say his death is his death for all people. You know. All right. So we got uh, blood, atonement, reconciliation, peace, and all that kind of stuff. So what Jesus does is he gathers people together to celebrate this atonement that will happen on the Friday. And uh, the next day, he will, he will uh, offer himself as the bloody sacrifice to fulfill the sacrificial tradition and now on the night before the meal tradition. He takes ordinary food. Did we talk about this last week? Um, the idea that bread was the, the normal meal. Okay, mm -hmm. it's, it's not like, well, I'm taking bread because God gave us manna. I'm taking bread because God ha had us eat unleavened bread at the Passover. Jesus takes bread because it's the stuff of daily life. 
And wine, wine interestingly enough, is the drink of daily life. It was mostly quite watered down so that you probably wouldn't get a buzz on all of it. But the concept there is that the ordinary drink, and the drink then we're gonna punch it up a little when we have a celebration. We're gonna put a little more of the juice into it, is a, a sign of festivity or a sign of gathering and, and rejoicing. So these two elements that Jesus takes are the substance and recognition of day-to-day -day life, all right? He says, this is my body, not indicating that this is the fleshy part of my being, but rather to indicate this is my whole person. And the blood is likewise a symbol of his whole person. That is his spirit. The body re retains the concept of his material uh, being so body and blood complete the um, the total gift uh, of the sacrifice that will take place on Friday body and blood okay um, let's take a look then at an interpretation this is an interpretation of this sacrificial death this bloody death of Jesus? No, it's really, it's really Jesus himself. He gives himself. Not, nothing is taken from him. He gives himself. And so, it's not about the sin of the people. It's not the perpetrators of the crucifixion or anything. Like you mentioned in Bible study, Jesus was never a victim throughout right. his whole Right. Passion. Right. All right, uh, this is from the 10th, well, this is the 10th chapter of the letter to the Hebrews. And we're going to read all the way through it and uh, get a sense of what the letter to the Hebrews wanted, to, wanted us to understand about the Eucharist and what Christ is doing with his cross. All right, um, Hebrews was written at the end of the first century. So we're looking at already a document that is um, re reflective of the cultural tradition, the Christian cultural tradition by the time, by the year 90, let's say, or the year 100, somewhere around there. Gospels have been written the, and, and, and uh, you know, circulated, and the, the letters of St. Paul were written way back 50 years ago. Now we're going to get another reflection on what, uh, what this means. Okay. Since the law has only a shadow of the good things to come and not the very image of them, it could never make perfect those who come to worship by the same sacrifices that they offer continually each year. There's the answer to your question. Right. Otherwise, would not the sacrifices have ceased to be offers, offered? Since the worshipers, once cleansed, would no longer have any consciousness of sins. But in those sacrifices, there's only a yearly remembrance of sins. For it is impossible that the blood of goats, bulls, and goats take away sins. All right. What he's dealing with there is the event of Yom Kippur. Okay? And th what the high priest does on the feast of Yom Kippur. There's two goats. One is slaughtered and burned as a sin offering, and the other has its 
has hands laid on its head to impose all the sins of the people of God for that year on the head of the goat, and then the goat is sent out into the wilderness. He is not killed. He's sent out into the wilderness. We call this the scapegoat, right? This is the scapegoat, the one who takes away the sins of the people for that year. But we have to do it every year. Every year in Yom Kippur, we do the same thing. We send a goat out with our, and we offer another goat as a sin offering. Okay? So the author says, hey, that ain't going to work. All right? Uh, for this reason, he came into the world. All right. He said... Sacrifice an offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. Holocausts and sin offerings you, did, you took no delight in. Then I said, as it, as it is written of me in the scroll, Behold, I come to do your will, O God. This is from the Psalms, and I can't quote you which Psalm it is from, but he's, the letter to the Hebrews is quoting the Psalms there, and... Uh, helping us to understand. First, he says, sacrifices and offerings, holocausts and sin offerings, you neither desired nor delighted in. There's a song that says um, what God is speaking to the people. What makes you think I need the blood of goats and bulls? I don't eat the blood of goats and bulls. Um, I own all the beasts on the hillside. Why would I uh, why would I need your sacrifices of your blood sacrifices from bulls and goats? I don't need that. So that's the song that we're reflecting on here. But why is it required? Huh? Why is it required if he doesn't need them? It's it's the understanding of the people that this is what God requires to be satiated pacified, uh, connected with, and in a certain sense, that's what it does, you know, to take a bull and to say, this is a, a priceless animal, it's worth $10,000, say, okay, I'm going to take this bull, I'm going to slaughter it, offer it up as an offering to God, showing that I lean on him. I, I, I require him. I have to have him. So this concept of sacrificial offerings, you missed the first week. <laughs> That's why. Oh. This concept of sacrificial <laughs> offerings uh, was understood by people as to make atonement for God. Mm. All right? And the, the development of sacrificial offerings took on that tone. But then what happens to any religious tradition? It becomes bastardized. It becomes just a matter of, oh, here's a sheep, have that, God, you know. Oh, and there is no real reverence or whatever given to it. So the psalmist reflects on that. And later on in the prophets, when we have Isaiah, Jeremiah, Ezekiel, they're going to reflect on the fact that this really isn't the real sacrifice. The real sacrifice is a contrite heart, a willing spirit. You know, that's that's the sacrifice. Okay. Um, okay. He takes away the first to establish the second. By this will, we have been consecrated. Through the offering of the body of Jesus Christ once for all. Every priest stands daily at his ministry. He's talking about Old Testament temple priests. Offering frequently those same sacrifices that can never take away sins. But this one, Jesus, uh, offered one sacrifice for sins and took his seat forever at the right hand of God. All right, that's justification. That's finding the right place, being in the right relationship, being in the uh, proper 
relationship to God. So Jesus assumes his rightful place in this act of justification. But this one offered, one, uh, one sacrifice for sins and it took his feet. Now, he waits until his enemies are made his footstool. For by one offering, he has made perfect forever those who are being consecrated. In other words, in that offering, he took all of us and all of our future and all the people who are still to come and all the people in the past. He took them all and presented them to the Father. Um, okay, 16. This is the covenant I will establish with them after those days, says the Lord. I will put my law laws in their hearts, and I will remember and their evil doing what's their sins and their evil doing, I will remember no more. This comes from the prophet Jeremiah. So Hebrews is just picking up the prophet's words here and talking about this new covenant of the heart. Um where there is forgiveness of these, he also says, that where there is forgiveness of these, there is no longer offering for sin. Therefore, brothers, since through the blood of Jesus, we have confidence of entrance into the sanctuary, by the new and living way he opened up for us through the veil that is his flesh, and since we have a great high priest over the house of God, let us approach with a sincere heart and absolute trust with our hearts sprinkled clean. Well, you know what that's a reference to? Baptism of fire. Hmm? Fire. Yeah, when was that? Passover. You, well, the Passover led into the covenant, the sealing of the covenant, and the sealing of the Sinai covenant was done with the sprinkling of bull's blood. Okay, so that's what he's referring to. Sprinkle clean uh, uh, from an evil conscience and our bodies washed in pure water. There's baptism. Let us hold unwaveringly to our confession that gives us hope. For he who made the promise is trustworthy. We must consider how to rouse one another to love and good works. We should not stay away from our assembly, as is the custom of some, but encourage one another, and this all the more as you see the day drawing near. That's the end times. I'm going to turn it over. But when Christ came as high priest of the good things that have come to be, Passing through the great and more permanent tab uh, tabernacle not made by hands that is not belonging to this creation. All right, so he's going to talk about a downward movement and an upward movement. So that Jesus comes from the Father, passes into this life, and then returns to the Father in, the, in a similar way. Where are you? I'm back. Verse, verse 11. Where, what chapter is it? Same, 10. But I went from, you went from 25 to verse 11? No. Yeah. I must have goofed up. Mm -hmm. uh, this might, might be chapter 11. Oh, But when Jesus, yeah, I, I'm going to guess it's chapter 11. I have a book right here. I don't want to look at it. Okay. Since I'm not very well versed in the Bible. <laughs> Wait for the assurance of things hoped for is chapter 11, verse 1.
have uh, verse uh, chapter 9. Verse Judge 11. verse 11. That's what it is. What is it? <clears throat> so this is 9. Chapter 9. All right. But when Christ came as high priest of the good things that have come to be, passing through the great and more perfect tabernacle, not made by hands. The tabernacle was seen as the house of God or the dwelling place of God. So the tabernacle was a tent in the desert and then later morphed into the temple. Okay, So he's using an older image here. He entered once for all into the sanctuary, not with the blood of goats and calves, but with his own blood, thus obtaining eternal redemption. For if the blood of goats and bulls and the sprinkling of a heifer's ash can sanctify those who are, are defiled so that their flesh is cleansed, how much more, and that's a reference to Moses and the red heifer, um, it's kind of an obscure story, but it's the idea that a red heifer will cleanse the, the people of their sins. For this reason, um, how much more will the blood of Christ, who through the eternal spirit, offered himself unblemished to God, cleanse our consciences from dead works to worship the living God? For this reason, he is mediator of a new covenant. The dead works things come from St. Paul, and especially his letter to the Romans. For this reason, he's mediator of a new covenant. So we talked last week about whether this was a new covenant mm -hmm. or this was a covenant simply renewed. And what did we decide? It depended on who you asked. Okay. I don't think we decided. No. 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 But I... I like to think of it as the continuing covenant. All right, not a new covenant, but in many respects, it takes on the place. It takes the place of the new covenant. Since a death has taken place for deliverance from transgressions under the first covenant, those who are called may receive the promise eternal inheritance. There's that concept again of death is necessary for the cleansing of sin to be a permanent stop of life. Now, where there is a will, the death of the testator must be established. For a will takes effect only at death. There's no force while the testator is alive. Thus, not even the first covenant was inaugurated without blood. When every commandment has been proclaimed by Moses to all the people according to the law, he took the blood of calves and goats together with water and crimson wool and hyssop and sprinkled both the book itself and all the people, saying, This is the, the blood of the covenant which God has enjoined upon you. In the same way, he sprinkled also the tabernacle and the vessels of worship with blood. According to the law, almost everything is purified by blood. And without the shedding of blood, there is no forgiveness. Therefore, it was necessary for the copies of the heavenly things to be purified by these rites. But the heavenly things themselves by better sacrifices than these. For Christ did not enter a sanctuary made by hands, a copy of the truth but heaven itself, that he might now appear before God on our behalf. Not that he might himself repeat it, not that he might offer himself repeatedly as the high priest enters each year into the sanctuary with blood that is not his own. If that were so, he would have to suffer repeatedly from the foundation of the world. But now once for all, he has appeared to the end of the ages to take away sin by his sacrifice. Just as he appointed that human beings died, die once, and after this comes the judgment, so also Christ offered once to take away the sins of many and will appear a second time, not to take away sin, but to bring salvation 
to those who eagerly await. All right, chapters 9 and 10 of the letter to the Hebrews helps us kind of understand the nature of blood, the nature of sacrifice, the nature of uh, types. We've talked about types before. The, the idea of a type is there are types, Plato would call them forms. There are ideal forms that exist in the heavenly <coughs> realm. And the antitype is the thing that appears among us as a sign of that greater reality or a, a, a form that we cannot perceive. All right, who's got a question? And did you think that this was all that? This was all in the Eucharist. <laughs> <laughs> well, yeah, but it'd be hard to explain to a newbie. Yeah, right. <laughs> or evangelize. Oh, here, this is what the Eucharist is about. Yeah. Let's read the Eucharist. <laughs> yeah, that's why we do a, a seven-week class, yeah. uh, you know, to kind of get people into understanding that it's a very complicated concept. It isn't. It isn't just, you know, why can't I receive it? You know? Something that stood out <coughs> speaking to kids and parents all the time about pastoral history and the real presence of Jesus in the Eucharist. I must have heard it before, but tonight, the, when you said it's his whole body, because it, it, we hear, this is my flesh, right? There's, there's parts of the Eucharistic prayer where mm -hmm. it's, Flesh is mentioned. Flesh is mentioned, yeah. In, in this literal sense versus... Um, yeah. Uh, but to, but to, but to say the whole body puts it in a completely different context that almost strangely makes it easier to conceptualize and yeah. understand. Yeah, we can, and we, can, we can accept that better than gnawing on flesh. <laughs> or... Chewing on sinews, you know. And it seems less like a burnt offering. offering. It seems less sort of <coughs> gruesome. Previous. Yes. I mean, if you, if you don't take into consideration what truly happened, which, yeah. which is far more gruesome. Um, but yeah, the, I, the, the, the concept of it... Uh, almost seems palatable when you talk about, well, it's his whole person. Yeah. But, you know, in the Gospel of John, chapter 6, he makes that deliberate attempt to get you to accept the utter reality of Christ's flesh. He talks about, he does use the word to gnaw on mm -hmm. or to uh, chew with one's teeth. Unless you gnaw on my body and guzzle down my blood, you have no life in you. Now, did he, did he want to refer to the, the corpuscles and cells and all that kind of stuff? No. He wanted to present his body in such a way that people would understand this is real. This is not, not metaphor. This is not uh, a spiritual concept. This is real in the sense that it touches our real lives. Father, when John was writing that, the way I understood it was that we're not being timid about taking his body and blood, that it's like with gusto, with passion, yeah. with, mm -hmm. with heart, mm -hmm. uh, we're doing this. It's, it's not a, something that we do halfway. Right. Right. And I think you're right. I think that he wants to emphasize that point in a, in a very stark and, wow, a way to stop you and to consider what, you're, what are you doing? What are you, we, need to, we need to get everyone to that place. What, what are you doing? Just walking up there, waltzing up there. <laughs> taking that. Gum out. Yeah. <laughs> gum out. Really? 
Okay, anything else on Hebrews? No. We're going to transition into early church and how the early church understood the Eucharist and what was important <coughs> for them. Now, I'm going to tell you right off that the early church, and I'm talking about the fathers of the church, so we're talking about 2nd century, 3rd century, 4th century, 5th century. Mm -hmm. We're talking about those, those 500 years there. Um, and where the content of our faith was really hammered out and solidified. And, uh, and finally documented in the great... Um, creedal statements that came out of the early church. So, the Eucharist, uh, we have the first outside of Scripture evidence of the celebration of the Eucharist from a guy named Justin Martyr. Now, his last name wasn't Martyr, it's what <laughs> happened to him. So, anyway, let's start. Oh no, we have the first reference from Ignatius of Antioch. So, those among yourselves. Oh, thank you. I'm just sitting here just really seeing how it works. Did I give you enough? One more. One more. One more. <laughs> Father Justin Martyr. He was just, he was somebody in that time who just documented a lot, took really copious notes. Well, what happens, what, most of the documents, documentation of the Eucharist or things like that are written about in letters. Mm -hmm. They're not written, or, uh, written down as theological treatises. Rather, they're meant to elucidate the mystery to somebody else. So it's usually a letter. It's a, usually a, an epistle against a particular heresy or something like that. So if you look on this page, you see the Ignatius of Antioch. Skip Irenaeus, first of all. He's, I don't know how he got in there, but he's in the wrong spot. <laughs> so we're looking at Ignatius of Antioch. And Ignatius of Antioch uh, made a journey to his death. And in his journey to his death, which ultimately was martyrdom, he sent letters back to other churches, offering them inspiration and hope and, and uh, theology. And so his is, his is one of the first witnesses. I have no taste for corruptible food, nor for the pleasures of this life. I desire the bread of God, which is the flesh of Jesus Christ. Gosh, in the, in the year 110, we don't have any doubt about it. Who was the seed of David, and I for drink I desire his blood, which is love and corruptible. Take note of those who hold heterodox opinions on the grace of Jesus Christ, which has come to us, and see how contrary their opinions are to the mind of God. They abstain from the Eucharist and from prayer because they do not confess the Eucharist as the flesh of our Savior, Jesus Christ, flesh which suffered for our sins and which that and which that Father in his goodness raised up again. Those who deny the gift of God are perishing in their disputes. All right, what did the early church believe about Jesus' uh, uh, body? First of all, they understood that it was his physical body, but not his fleshly body. In other words, there was something about his person that was contained in the Eucharist. And that bodily sense is both his pre-resurrected self 
and his resurrected self. So one of the things that we believe in as Catholic Christians is the idea that w there is a resurrection of the body. And that somehow the body and the soul will be rejoined. Now we're celebrating the body and soul of Christ rejoined every time we celebrate the Eucharist. Okay, So we're not celebrating a body that has blood. We're celebrating a celestial body, and yet that body is also has its roots in or has its relationship to an earthly body, but it's not the same, okay? So, that's one of the things that we believe about the Eucharist. Do you understand that? Mm -hmm. You're looking puzzled, Diane. <laughs> Got those rocks kind of softening <laughs> up over there. Source the body. All right, let's take a look at Justin Martyr. Justin is writing to the governor of uh, his province in, in uh, Syria, and he wants to explain to the governor why the Christians are no threat. See, everyone thinks the Christians are the, sec the secret sect that is going to destroy society, and so they want to put Christians to death because they're against... Uh, what Roman society was uh, uh, was all for. So Justin decides to write a defense to the governor about the Christian community. So he writes, We call this food Eucharist, and no one else is permitted to partake of it except one who believes our teaching to be true and who has washed in the washing which is for the remission of sins and for regeneration. In other words, has received baptism. And is thereby living as Christ and joined. Now, if you were to take that statement, just the one I just read, and said, this is for Catholics, what enables us to celebrate the Eucharist? That we're living the Christian way of life, that we have been baptized and we have been sanctified through that baptism mm -hmm. for the remission of our sins so that we may share in this food. Now, consider that this is being said in the second century. We didn't make this up last year <laughs> and said, oh, I'm sorry, you can't receive the Eucharist. No, it, it has a long standing condition in the life of the church that those who are living in Christ and are baptized are part of our community. Then why do the Protestants reject this? You know, that's the question I'm going to ask Jesus when I say <laughs> what, what was your thinking? Why? And the more, I, the more re reflection I have on the, the, um, the Protestant look at scriptures, is their, their emphasis is not sacramental. Right. Their emphasis is, is um, the word. Right. And the word heals us. And the word gives us salvation. And this is the word that this does. Then the, the word is from God. And so the signs and the sig symbols that we use are just another version of words mm -hmm. that they don't have. All right, let's take a look at um, Irenaeus. Irenaeus, he took from among creation, he, he focuses on the idea of bread and wine as the natural world. This is the natural world that is also assumed by Christ when he becomes flesh. He takes on the natural world, and so he uses the natural elements of bread and wine to be symbols for himself. He took from among creation that which is bread and gave thanks. This is my body. The cup, likewise, which is from, begin from among the creation to which belong, we belong. He confessed to be his blood. He taught the new sacrifice of the new covenant of which Malachi, one of the twelve minor prophets, had signified beforehand. You do not do my will, says the Lord Almighty, 
and I will not accept the sacrifice at, at, uh, at your hands. For from the rising of the sun to its setting, my name is glorified among the Gentiles, and in every place incense is offered to my name, and a pure sacrifice. For great is my name among the Gentiles, says the Lord Almighty. By these words he makes it plain that the former people will cease to make offerings to God, but that in every place sacrifice will be offered to him, and indeed a pure one, for his name is glorified among the Gentiles. The sacrificial tradition of the Jews has come to an end. They don't sacrifice anything after about the after the destruction of the temple. So that people who celebrated with sacrifice is no longer. But now there is a new people who celebrates with a sacrifice that will never end. The self-giving of Christ. If the Lord were from other than the Father, how could he, be, how could he rightly take bread, which is of the same creation as our own, and confess it to be his body, and affirm that the mixture of the cup is his blood, so one of the features that we talk about in terms of the the, Euchre, uh, the the cup is that it's always mixed, because that's the tradition of the of the Jews and the tradition of Jesus and the tradition tradition of the church. We're not talking about it. water and wine. But how does he say this? Drink this. This is my body. Drink this. This is my blood. When he is there in person. How does he say this? How does that happen? <laughs> I don't, I guess, I can't, he's there, and then he says, this is me. Mm -hmm. I, so he's in two places at the same time. Yeah, I do not. Um, no, it has to do with um, the idea that as this memorial is repeated, he is there, and therefore... Yes, he is there at the Last Supper, and the elements are there, and he transfers himself to those elements, but um, it isn't really fulfilled until his death on the cross. Okay. All right, and then God could be two places at once. <laughs> Three places. Three places. Three places. Father, Father Kevin, was it immediate? Where the ordained consecrated? No, we're going to talk about that next week. We're going to talk about the development of the, the home church and then the transition to clerics. Okay. Um, all right. He has declared the cup of part of creation to be his own. Did I already do this? Yeah. Last no. paragraph. No. no. He has declared the cup part of creation to be his own blood from which he causes our blood to flow and the bread part of creation he has established as his own body from which he gives increase unto our body when therefore the mixed cup and the baked and the baked bread receives the word of god and becomes the eucharist the body of christ and from these the substance of our flesh is increased and supported how can, that they, how can they say that the flesh is not capable of receiving the gift of God, which is eternal life? Flesh, which is nourished by the body and blood of the Lord, and is in fact a member of him. So, um, he goes even further uh, than the previous two authors and talks about how this... Um, brings us into the life of God itself. Do so, you have years for these guys? Yeah, they're, they're, they're right nine, after their name. Right or at the bottom, the bottom of each paragraph. So. Cyprian of Carthage. He, Paul, threatens, moreover, the stubborn and forward, and denounces them, saying, Whoever eats the bread or drinks the cup of the Lord unworthily is guilty of the body and blood of the Lord. Uh, we went over this last week, if you remember. 
1 Corinthians chapter 11. Uh, the oldest reference to the Eucharist is found there. And then Paul makes a big case of, of how that is, uh, what's the word, uh, maligned, uh, desecrated. desecrated, yeah, that's the word, all right. All these warnings, being scorned and contemned, lapsed Christians will often take the name before their sin is expiated, before confession has been made, of, been made of their crime, before their conscience has been purged by sacrifice and by the hand of the priest, before the offense of an angry and threatening Lord has been appeased. And so violence is done to his body and blood. And they now, against their Lord, more with their hand and their mouth, they now, they sin now, more against the, 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 their Lord with hand and mouth than what they denied their Lord. I always wondered about this, people who receive on the tongue saying it's more worthy. And I thought to myself, how many, how many more sins do you commit with your tongue than you do with your hands? You know? But it's more worthy to have the Eucharist on the tongue, I guess. I used to receive on the tongue, and I, I did it more for, I stopped at COVID. I don't know, I just felt a greater intimacy with the Eucharist going from a hand. There wasn't a break in that, I don't know, reception of it. Oh. It, was, it felt, I don't know, more of an intimate moment than mm. worthy. Yeah. But now... I just went to the hand at COVID and never went back. It's fine. Does it feel intimate? <laughs> yeah. I mean, I was going to say, does. you know, yeah. receiving in the hand is a relatively yeah. intimate experience. Yeah. So. I, don't, I feel it's intimate. COVID, yeah, it's no less now, but yeah. no, I did that for a long time because it just felt better. Yeah. Less. Not those who kneel they're even more reverent right? Right? Yeah. 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 straight on my back and like <laughs> drop it in <laughs> <laughs> they're, yeah just crawl all the way up and roll over <laughs> alright council of Nicaea now the great councils of the church there's been about 23 of them uh, over the last 2,000 years this was one of the very first, there was first the Council of Jerusalem in about the year 47, and then we come to the Council of Nicaea. So this is the, the second, what we call ecumenical council. <clears throat> and what this did was it gathered all the bishops of the, the Christian community in that part of the world. Well, that's all Christianity was. Uh, so basically, you got Syria, Turkey, <clears throat> Israel, Egypt, um, Greece, generally the Black Sea region. And so these bishops came together, and they had to deal with the heres heresy of Arianism. And the heresy of Arianism was denying the divinity of Christ and saying that he was the highest of all God's creatures, but he wasn't God. Mm -hmm. And so the council had to declare, make a statement, a creedal statement that became like kind of the Orthodox Church. This is our position. I believe in one God, the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth, and Jesus Christ, et cetera, et cetera. A creed developed from that, okay? Now, it has come to the knowledge of the Holy and Great Synod that in some districts and cities, the deacons administer the Eucharist to the presbyters. Oh my God, what a disaster. <laughs> Whereas neither canon nor custom permits that they who have no right to offer the Eucharist, the to offer the Eucharistic sacrifice 
should give the body of Christ to them that do offer it. That's all it really says about the Eucharist in the second uh, in the first Council of uh, uh, Nicaea. But it kind of begins to stratify, and mm -hmm. you begin to see the stratification of holy orders in the church, and who could do what, and and so mm -hmm. on and so forth. But it's being it's not being um, written down as law, like how the clergy should perform. Uh, that comes much, much later in terms of becoming doctrine, doctrine of the church. Right now, it's custom, it's habit, it's the ongoing development of the church in terms of its relationship with the Eucharist. So we're going to see that the celebration of the Eucharist and how we understand it determines the role of the priest. And so the development of the priesthood, which came about not early on, but later on, uh, is directly attributable to how the Eucharist is provided, how the Eucharist is celebrated, and what the early church understood about that. So that's the Council of Nicaea. The next guy, Aphrahat, the Persian sage I've never heard of. Oh. But that's all right. What is this blood that Isaiah foresaw, if not the Messiah's, which they <coughs> took upon themselves and their children, and the blood of the prophets whom they slew? This is the blood what, what, uh, that was red as scarlet and crimson, and it marked them. They can only be cleansed by washing the water of baptism and partaking of the body and blood of Christ. Blood is washed by blood, and body is cleansed by body. Sins washed away in water, and prayer converses with God's majesty. After, spo after having spoken thus at the Last Supper, the Lord rose up from the place where he had made the Passover and given his body, his food, and his blood, his drink. And he went with his disciples to the place where he was arrested. But he ate of his own body and drank of his own blood. There's the answer to your question. <laughs> He's God, he can do anything. While he was pondering on the dead. With his own hands, the Lord presented his own body to be eaten. Before he was crucified, he gave his blood and his drink. Mm -hmm. So what, 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 I, what we should be gleaning from all these passages is the concept of real presence, okay? That the real presence of Christ in the Eucharist is not something that we invented at some point, but rather has been the tradition since the earliest fathers of the church, been part of our tradition. <laughs> So back to when you come to the Reformation, how do you just throw it out after all of this history? I don't know. Do they did they throw do they throw these yeah. out? Yeah. They don't yeah. read the early church fathers? No, some some of them they do, but when it comes to Eucharistic theology, they avoid it. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Going back to the Cyprian one when they're when you're saying that Christians will take communion before their sin is expiated, did they have a form of confession or penance back then? They had a form of penance, not confession. And the penance was this, that basically you went to the bishop um, and you told him what you'd done. And, uh, or if it was public knowledge what you had done, you would be automatically excommunicated from the church. And so the church had guidelines by which one could uh, deny their membership. So if you wanted to be restated in the life of the faith community, you, you joined what was called the Order of Penitents. And the Order of Penitents, Penitents in the life of the church was a special group that was seeking to be reunited to the body of Christ. And normally, the order of penitents would ask of you five, ten years in which you would go to church 
faithfully every Sunday. You would acknowledge your sin at the door of the church to everyone who approached. Mm -hmm. You, in the early days, you sat in sackcloth and ashes. Oh. Mm -hmm. And mm -hmm. then by the end of those years, whatever the penance was, you were reconciled to the church. You weren't rebaptized. You were never rebaptized because he recognized that was once and for all. But that was the order of penance in those days. And then gradually, by the time of the 6th and 7th century, as the church spread to Ireland, uh, and in the in the third, uh, second to, uh, no, third to 6th century, as monasticism grew, there was a, t a, a, a type of sharing one's sin with a spiritual guide, a director. And the spiritual guide would usually give somebody penances to do in order to restore them to the life of the church more fully. They were never formally excommunicated, but internally they would have felt they needed some kind of uh, process by which they could be reunited to the church. The sacrament of penance then developed until the 11th century, and then we have the formal designation of the sacrament of uh, reconciliation. So it takes a long development. Uh, okay. Uh, Council of Ephesus. Just a question about Arapat. Is he, was he a Christian, or did he just understand this? Oh, he was a Christian. Oh. Yeah. Okay, the Council of Ephesus is either the third or fourth, uh, or fifth or sixth, somewhere in there. Um, there are like early councils of the churches. First and second, Nicaea. There's first and second, Chalcedon. There's first and second Ephesus, and so on. So I don't know where this comes in there, but it comes in within the first 500 years of the church. We will necessarily add this also. Proclaiming the death according to the flesh of the only begotten Son of God, that is Jesus Christ, confessing his resurrection from the dead and ascension into heaven, we offer the unbloody sacrifice in the churches, and so go on to the mystical thanksgiving and are sanctified, having received his holy flesh and the precious, precious blood of Christ the Savior in us all. And not as common flesh do we receive it, God forbid, nor as of man indwelling and associated with, of a man sanctified and associated with the word according to the unity of worth, or as having a divine indwelling, but as truly the life-giving and very flesh of the word himself. For he is the life according to his nature as God, and when he became united to the flesh, to his flesh, he made it he made his flesh also life-giving. Questions? Contact us. <laughs> <laughs> All right. So what, what I've got now is moved from Jesus and his intentions and the sacrificial and meal tradition into now how did the early church preside, celebrate, and understand what it was doing. Um, so let's go back a little and remind you that once the Jewish community was in dispersion after the Roman conquest and the destruction of Jerusalem in the year 70, um, there was there was only there were only synagogues. And so synagogues populated the Palestinian area, and synagogues also populated the Greek areas. So in 
North Africa, let's say in Egypt, there were synagogues and synagogues in Israel and synagogues in Jordan and synagogues in Syria and synagogues probably as far away as Rome. I mean, not probably, yes, there were synagogues in Rome as well. This was all on account of the dispersion that happened at, between the, uh, after the Babylonian captivity in the 6th century BC and up to the current time, and then the destruction of, of, by the Romans of the Jerusalem temple and the city of Jerusalem, this dispersion was radically expanded. So synagogues became the place where Jews worshipped. And synagogues were uh, both a school and a house of prayer. So uh, what had been once reserved for the priests in terms of sacrificing the lambs and offering them on the altar of, uh, in Jerusalem at the temple now becomes... Uh, the, there's a switch that takes place in the, at the core of religion, and the focus is on the word, okay? The, this transition took place earlier during the second Babylon, during the Babylonian captivity, when Israel had to go into Babylon and had no place to worship. They developed a new style of religion, and it was based on studying the scripture and being fed and nourished by the scriptures. So that's the tradition that was in existence combined with the temple sacrifices in Jerusalem. So when the temple ends, all you've got are these word services, which took place at the local synagogues now. And usually a leader or a, a, a rabbi or something like that would lead the synagogue service. But the most important services that took place in the life of the Israelites were at home. Okay? The home, the family became the center and the heart of religion, religious life, religious conversation, religious ritual. This was celebrated uh, every Sabbath in the home. So every Friday night, Sabbath would begin right after sundown, and there would be a meal, which was a Seder in, in the sense that uh, Seders are like the Passover where you uh, follow a script and you read about things that happened in the past. So there was a Sunday Seder, or a Sabbath Seder, with a central prayer called the Kedush, and the central prayer becomes kind of the form uh, of prayers. But there was also the reading of scripture. So you had both um, the uh, Torah, which is the first five books of the Bible. Torah was read. And then usually something from a later tradition, like the, the they called it the writings, because they weren't canonized into a scripture at that point. They were just the holy writings. And so the prophets, wisdom, so on and so forth. Those were used with this. Did I talk about this already? With a song, uh, with a song used between them. Okay? So, gather with the, with the opening prayer, the Kedush, the, the, the prayer that gathers us into the one. You sit to listen to a lesson from the Torah. Then you, you pray a psalm response. And the psalm response was usually antiphonal. And then you heard a reading from one of the writings. And then the rabbi or the guest speaker, which is often the case, would offer a reflection on God's word found there. So that sounds familiar? Mm -hmm. no, so it's yes. very much like what we do because it is what we do. Yeah. Is this in the synagogue? Because we were in the home. This is in the, this is, yeah, okay. I, I ended, uh, so this is now in the synagogue. So 
the prayer uh, at the home finishes and next morning we go to synagogue and this is how we mm -hmm. pray okay so then after the sermon or whatever it was uh, there was intercessory prayers and the intercessory prayers were directed to God and and uh, you know commended for their future well-being and so on and so forth and they went home <clears throat> now the early Christian community were all Jews this is what they do this is what they understood you go to synagogue you listen to the Torah you listen to the prophets or one of the readings. You pray the Psalms. It's da, 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 da. Um, but we need the opportunity to celebrate the Lord's Supper. And so the early Christian community would leave the synagogue and go to somebody's house. And usually it was like a small gathering of two families, three families, something like that. Where the leader of that household the male leader of the household would then provide the Eucharistic uh, sacrifice. So they would bring out bread, and they would bring out wine. Sometimes it happened in the middle of the meal. So they'd be there having spaghetti, spaghettios, <laughs> and uh, then they put those aside. They bring forth bread. They bring forth wine. And then they would offer those to the Lord. And the, the, the father of the family or the male leader of the family <coughs> would lead the prayer. And it was often something spontaneous on his part because there was no written prayers. There was only the prayer of the heart and the prayer of the, you know, lifting up the voice. And so he said the prayer as best he could often trying to remember what the Lord did on the night before he died. But not necessarily, because some of them wouldn't remember that or know it well enough. So that it was an offering of thanks and praise in the name of Jesus, the Savior, offered to God. They would share in communion, and they would either part finish the meal off, it's time for cookies, or they would go home. Okay? And then each week, they would do the same thing. Well, as would happen, the Jews eventually got tired of the Christian Jews and their difference in terms of their theology and their understanding of salvation and so on and so forth. And gradually, to, uh, they gradually excluded them. This developed in the opportunity for the church then to reconstitute itself as a Christian community and to focus more directly on how are we going to celebrate this great event in our past as the Jews did. And they brought some elements with them, such as the Sabbath Seder, and they incorporated the newer elements from Jesus and his legacy. So this, this began the beginning of the uh, development of the Eucharist as a form of worship in the life of the church. And you can see in that structure the very rudimentary beginning of what we have today in Mass. All right? Mm -hmm. What else? Do you have any questions? Because we're kind of done for tonight. Yeah. The ones, the ones that went to the homes, they, they are the Christians who believe in Christ. The ones that stay in the synagogue are the ones who believe that Christ was only a, a great prophet? You got it. Any other thoughts or questions or remarks? Or? So these family celebrations, um, the breaking of bread and all that was before it got to the Deacons and the presbyters. Oh, yeah. Fighting. Um, so we, we hear the report of deacons and presbyters already as early as St. Paul. Um, but the structure of their role in the Eucharist doesn't develop until later. So what happens is the head of the household 
uh, who was the leader of the Eucharistic gathering, uh, later on the communities collected together and they had a, uh, he was called an episkopos, which is our uh, Greek word for bishop, but an episkopos was a manager. He was the manager of the community. He was the hands-on help that the community needed in terms of the, the distribution of goods, the care of the sick. The, he was the manager in that sense. Well, the manager got rather, uh, the manager gathered uh, uh, an esteem and an importance in the life of the community and began to be seen as not a manager, but as a religious leader, a religious figure, a father of a group. So I could be the Episcopus of this gathering here, I might say. It would be incumbent upon me to lead the Eucharist in that context. And uh, he would accept that willingly because that's, you know, that's your tradition, that's your, that's part of your past. And then that develops even more. So that by the time Paul addresses Timothy and Titus, uh, and they are bishops, one in Ephesus and one in Crete, uh, he's got a more legislated uh, uh, role for them to play. But then they say that those aren't written by Paul and were written by some successors. So we're looking at later. Anyway, so anyway, we'll talk about, we'll talk, we'll recap some of this next week and we'll talk about it next week. Okay. Okay.